Hi everyone, we are live. Welcome to this webinar. I am very excited about this. As you can see from the screen, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get all of these questions that you've been asking me that other people have asked answered on this webinar. Grab a pen and paper, set aside preferably more than 60 minutes. We're about to start in 60 seconds. Just let me know you can see and hear me. We'll just do some housekeeping before we start and before we go live on air. You should be able to see me. You should be able to see the screen. Let me know that you can see and hear me in the chat box. Feel free to ask me any additional questions as we go along. Although, if you read these questions just before we start, we're about to start uh, any second now, then you will also see that uh, we're going to be uh, answering probably almost all the questions you could possibly, 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 possibly have. Okay, so let me know. Yes, you can see and hear me. Thank you for that stuff. Uh, Alan, thank you one and all. Are you ready to begin? If you are, we will start. Before we do start, let me just turn the screen share off so you can see me properly. Okay, you should be able to see me. Like I said, in this webinar, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the 15 investment questions everybody's always wanted to ask us but, but has been too afraid. And we're going to start off with, is COVID a good or bad time to enter the market? And if we're worried about risk, what should we do? What are the strategies? What are the inside hedge funds saying? What are the big banks telling their wealthiest clients? It's my job to know those things. Why should you trust me? I don't want you to trust me. I want you to trust the independently verifiable knowledge I'm going to give you, the independent website sources I'm going to give you. Equally, you might say, well, surely buying stocks is risky anyway. Should we just stick to UK ones or whichever domestic market you're from? And let me know where you're from as well, which part of the world you're all from as well. Um, you'll also want to know what should your investment goals be. I'm going to cover that as well. And like I said, much, much more. All those 15 questions I'm going to put up on screen. You can read them yourself, though they are what, re what returns are reasonable. What if, this, what if you pick a stock and the price goes up? What if it falls? What should you do? How long should you hold on for? Okay. Um, what's the quickest, easiest way to pick stocks? that the gurus, the banks, the hedge funds have already researched for their wealthy clients so you can ride on their coattails. Remember, we're talking about investing. How much do we need for retirement? How long will it take to turn 10,000 into 100,000? What do statistics and history tell us? For, or turn 100,000 into a million? What do statistics and history tell us? Who's done it before? How can we copy what they've done so we're not reinventing the wheel? What if we don't have time for all of this? How do we reduce the time process? What if we've already got a fund manager or an IFA, an independent financial advisor? How do we make sure we're asking them the right questions, okay, to keep on their back? Uh, how do we find a good broker? Okay, what if we want a bit more risk? You might want to do a CFD, God forbid, a spread bet on this. Well, can we do that for the long term, for a 12-month holding, a 24-month holding? Is that sensible? What if we want to save tax? How do we do that? All of those things, all of those things I'm going to cover. Uh, Alan from beautiful Scotland, Dave Essex, wonderful to have you all on here, everyone else coming on board as we speak. So some housekeeping. First things first, pen and paper, please. Also, grab a phone. You'll want to take pictures of some of the slides, okay, because some of them will not be uh, recirculated, all right? So pen and paper, uh, grab water. Make sure there is no other disturbances because this is your financial future we are talking about. Uh, and if it's your financial future, it's important enough for you, then you really shouldn't be trying to watch TV. Make sure nobody else is using the internet. Uh, and we're going to begin. We're going to begin. So here we go. Everybody ready? Are you all ready, set, go? Quick in information. Look, this is not individual advice to each of you because I don't know each of your personal circumstances. There might be billionaires on here. There might be pensioners on here. There might be people who are 20 years old on here. So it's not individual advice. And it is not just because I'm going to show you what's in my son's investment account and in my pension. It is not advice for you to go out and buy it without the education which I'm going to give you. All right. One other thing I always do, I'm co-chairman of a charitable trust when you make your millions, okay? Because, by the way, investing is the most useless profession in the world. It is the hardest, easy money you'll ever make, right? When you make your millions, please do what I do and support a good charitable foundation. If you can't think of one, might I suggest the Lumbar Foundation, of which, like I said, I'm co-chair along with Lord Billamoria um, and Dr. Lalvani. 
his son uh, you might know from uh, Dragon's Den. Uh, his son's on Dragon's Den. Anyway, um, just an idea, but something I want to mention only because, like I said, investing is the most useless profession in the world. Why are we here? Why are we here? We're here because this is what a typical portfolio looks like. One of my students, and I encourage all my students to do this, they sent me in their portfolio. We then put it through uh, some of my filters, and this is just a, a small example. And this is what their portfolio looks like. It's pretty bad. They don't realize it's bad because they don't even know what they should be doing. It's like somebody taking a car into a mechanic, um, but having no idea how to open the hood and how to read what the engine looks like. And then that's my job, is to analyze portfolios and educate you so you can do it yourself so you can see what's green what's red what's good what's bad and do that really quickly time is money so we've got to save time when we're doing these things okay i'm going to share the poll the poll for those of you who clicked it uh, uh 59 percent of you said the FTSE will be higher from where it is today by the end of the year good i've got a good optimistic bunch personally Let's see. I don't uh, uh, seek to forecast where the FTSE is going to be one way or the other. I want to make sure if it rises, well, obviously my stock should rise. If it falls, my stock should protect me from falls uh, and not fall as much as the rest of the FTSE or the Dow and uh, should recover a lot quicker. In other words, I want to win no matter what. It's as simple as that. I do not plan on losing just because the market's going in one direction uh, 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 and, and you know the job is to win whether it goes up or down it's as simple as that so question number one so many of you asked me this was the first question is this COVID thing good or bad timing for investing is it good because the markets uh, are, are depressed or actually the markets are only 10 percent off their all-time highs in the us so is it a bad time should we wait surely the economy is going to get smacked what are the insiders saying? Let me tell you some of the most important things that I'm seeing across my desk. First thing, this is from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. This is their projections for 2021. So I'm going to give you some good news first. The good news is this is what they project global growth to be next year. And let's just look at some of these countries. Let's look at the UK, 4%. The UK is not at 4% GDP growth. Of course, the IMF could be wrong, but not at 4% GDP growth since I think about the 1950s, my friend, since about the 1950s. Oh, what about the US? 4.7%? That's big for America. China, it's already on its way up there. It's at 9.2%. They try and target 10%. That's big. Now, you might say, well, of course, they're going to have so much growth. They've screwed this year up. Yes, that's right. But at least the IMF, and the, and this is one reason why the global market, certainly the Chinese and the US markets, uh, are, are near their all-time highs, is because some of this economic data. So we're sitting back and we're thinking, oh, we've got some reasons to relax. But the issue is, should we be getting in now? Okay, because it's not about going in blindly and saying, oh, well, this is fine, Alpesh, thanks very much. I'll leave you now. I'll just put a load of money into everything. Well, into what? No, we still want to protect ourselves, no matter what, under all circumstances. So what are the specifics? This is the million mild view. What's the, what's the, uh, uh, what's the localized view? Put another way, this is what McKinsey, and it's the job of McKinsey to uh, uh, make these kind of clever diagrams. This is the scenarios for economic impact during COVID-19, according to them, all right? And their view is if the public health response is good, Right, if it's good, like up here, uh, in fact, let me draw a pen. Come on, Alpesh, use a bloody pen. There we go. If the public response is better, and if the interventions uh, uh, like tax breaks and government spending is good, then we'd get a V shape recovery. Personally, you know, the best description I like is that we've got a K shaped recovery. Now, I know it sounds stupid, but let me explain. In other words, there's about 10% of the economy and companies which are just skyrocketing. Right, and I'm going to, those are the types that I want. And then there's the rest, which is going to take longer, higher risk. God knows when it's going to recover. Those are the ones I want to avoid. That's where I think we are. So what we're going to focus on on this webinar is, well, what is the upper leg on the K? Which bit's doing that bit? Okay, because there are some which are, you know, they're going to have this. Uh, uh, so we've got one part of the economy doing that. We've got one part which is doing that. That's the way I see it. This is from McKinsey, like I said. Uh, we want to focus on this webinar and naming names on that. If I'm going to give you some other good news, it's this. Look, the world's been through these kind of pandemics, academic um, uh, uh, epidemics before. Nothing as bad as this in living memory, but it has, and it's had shocks, and it's tended to recover. Well, I could easily argue, well, this time it's different. Of course, it's different this time. However, we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it, particularly because every single country in the world 
is determined to get through it, including the international bodies like the IMF. But that doesn't tell us which stocks we should have in our pension. What's our pensions going to look like? Are we already overvalued? Well, this was interesting when it came across my desk. This is from Morgan Stanley. Uh, and as hedge fund manager, I get a lot of data on my desk. My job is to find out the 1% which is interesting and relevant and the 99% which is bullshit. Okay, so the S&P 500 uh, is pretty much tracking what it did since 2009. Uh, and uh, what this suggests is that we will go sideways for a bit and then should go even higher. I don't know. Is it going to happen, isn't it? I don't know. I honestly don't know. But one thing that I do know is the stocks that I'm going to show you a name uh, uh, will, of course, rise when the tide is rising. That's the easy bit. Any idiot can do that. But if sh this should be wrong and Morgan Stanley are wrong and they go this way, then at least my stocks will not fall as far as the rest of the market and they will rebound sooner and quicker. And I will prove to you why and how that should be the case. Equally, people are asking at the moment, Alpes, are you insane with COVID talking about investments? Look at the NASDAQ, my friend. Look at the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ um, is overvalued, for instance, they're telling me. And I'm saying, well, let's have a look at this. What you can see in white, what you see in white uh, on this image, okay, let me just draw that for you in white, is what we've been doing in the NASDAQ at the moment. And what you see in blue is what's happened in the past uh, from 1995 to 2000. And in actual fact, the massive rally that we had in the NASDAQ in the past, before it all crashed, of course, was far, far, far bigger than what we're talking about at the moment. Uh, well, does that mean the NASDAQ's not overvalued? Well, I'd say some of the companies are, so we're going to avoid those. We're only going to look at companies which have got, and I'm going to show you the bits that I need them to have. They're going to have strong earnings, good cash flow, good croquis, good sortinas, good alphas. If you don't know what sortina, croquis, alpha, and altman is, I will teach you. And they're, they're, the, they're the numbers that the hedge fund industry looks like. They're the numbers Warren Buffett looks at. They're the numbers George Soros looks at. Um, Bill Ackman looks at. Okay, so if you don't know what those are, well, you'll get educated in this and it'll save you a hell of a lot of time uh, instead of messing around with PE ratios. Okay, why should you trust me? That's another question. Nobody actually asked this, obviously. Maybe they were too polite. But you should ask, why should you trust me? I don't want you to trust me. Uh, I'm on TV. You shouldn't trust anybody who's on TV, obviously. I've been doing this for 20-odd years. Um, that's my own show, Making Money with Sally. And then this is me on her show on the BBC called The Briefing. Nice parallel in life. And so for over 20 years, I've been doing this. That doesn't mean you should trust me. All it means is I've got a track record. Great. Good. You know, TV likes me because they follow my track record. They say, good, that doesn't mean you should trust me. I want you to trust the education I'm going to give you. All right? That's why. Um, who's on this webinar? Who's on this webinar? Well, we've got pensions, we've got 20-somethings. We've got a whole bunch of people who are disappointed with their financial advice. Because I've asked people, you know, why are you on this webinar? And someone said, well, I'm fed up with my uh, financial advice. He hasn't got a clue what he's doing. He's putting me in funds which go nowhere. And I keep hearing that these other companies are making all-time highs. So what the hell? Who is this guy? And he keeps charging me a small fortune. Others are saying, I don't know which even broker to use. You know, I've had a spouse who's passed away. I've got to look after the, the future now. What do I do? I need some education, education, education. All right. Should you trust me? Well, I'm going to give you the best bits from all my uh, know-how and my 200-odd uh, uh, columns in the Financial Times. Okay. Should you trust me? Well, so that's education, which has been vetted and peer-reviewed. And should you trust me? Well, these organizations do. Again, you might think, oh, I don't care, Alpesh. Should you trust me? I'm going to give you the best information I've had from published books, my books, okay? Each of these I've written, uh, which gives you some idea that, yeah, okay, there's some credibility here. The guy knows what he's talking about. By the way, have all of you got an electric, ver electric an electronic version of this book? My book, Investing on Pub, published by Paul Grave Macmillan. It, a, a, an electronic copy. I don't mean you've paid for it. I mean a free one from me. Have you got one? If not... Tell me, okay, and I'll make sure that you get one, all right? Full electronic. It's about 500-odd pages, and it's brilliant, uh, if I say so myself, okay? There's people reviewing it um, who are hedge fund managers. Uh, Philip Hampshire, you'll know from the BBC, for instance, Traders Magazine, and so on and so forth. So if you haven't, okay, there's a few of you. David Smith said no. Marika said no. Come on, guys. Um, all right, I will make sure by the end of the jazz, a whole bunch of you are saying no, you haven't. End of the webinar, everyone who stays on to the end, Jazz, um, Josephine, everyone else, you will have, for being on this webinar, a free 
electronic copy of the whole 500 pages of this book. And trust me, it's worth it. As it says, as seen on Bloomberg TV, it's got all the best education you could possibly want. It retails for about $50, by the way. Okay, there it is. You have a full, full uh, copy. And it's got not just my experiences uh, and expertise, but every other hedge fund manager. There's loads who haven't got it. That's ridiculous, because if you follow me, you should know how to get it. I will make sure all of you, by the end of the webinar, will have a free copy of that, okay? The question then, another question out of the 15 questions, surely buying global stocks is risky, Alpesh. Let me tell you what's risky, okay, before I give you the names of stocks that I like. This was 8th of September, 8th of September 2020. On the 8th of September 2020, uh, and so that was that three days ago, more than one trillion pounds of Muppet money costing savers billions. You know what that was? A whole bunch of savers have 1.5 trillion pounds pounds of cash, and we're just talking UK, let alone the US at the moment, spread across ISA savings and current accounts, according to the Bank of England, an amount roughly equal to the combined value of all UK residential mortgages. They called it Muppet money. I didn't call it that. They called it Muppet money. Why? Because it's losing income. It's losing capital gains. It's losing investing. Can you believe it? There's 1.5 trillion pounds worth of uh, uh, cash stored in those accounts. Now, I've been saying we need to invest, all right? I will make sure, Daksha, John, everyone will get a free copy of that. Uh, by the end of the webinar, you'll be given a link to get a free copy of the book. I've been saying investing in global equities, not just UK ones, global ones. I'm going to prove to you why. And the biggest mistake so many of you are making is you're investing only in domestic ones. I'm going to not only tell you why global, but which ones and how you determine it. The solution is the world is your oyster. Don't trust 20-something bloody fund managers. This is my article. Guess what? September the 11th, so today, right, 1999, 21 years ago, you can see from the photo of me, 21 years ago, I said it, all right, 21 years ago, I told you, lovely people, let me zoom in, right, look at what I told you, uh, you should probably sell up your entire UK holdings and buy only US ones, that's not me being unpatriotic, it's me being very patriotic, I'm British, it's me saying, I want you to own assets around the world, that's what I'm saying, okay, now, don't take my word for it. How's those 21 years done for you? I've got it in print. I'm not I'm not making stuff up. I'm telling you, and there's proof from the Financial Times, 1999, September the 11th, today, all right? 21 years ago, I stand by my words. And you might say, no, Alpesh. Um, sorry, the UK did better than the US over that period. Let me tell you how badly you did if you didn't take my advice. This is the FTSE 100 over those 21 years. It's at the same level. It's at the same level. This annoys me to an extent I cannot begin to tell you. 21 years ago, people didn't listen to me, right? How did I know? How did you know, Alpesh, right? 21, and it's at the same, oh, Alpesh, surely the Dow's at the same level. Are you kidding me? Go Google it, right? Surely the Nasdaq's at the same level it was 21 years ago. Are you kidding me, right? This is just year to date, if you were investing in US equities, because global companies are listed on the US exchanges, by the way, Chinese companies are, Indian companies are, they're listed, the biggest ones are listed on the US exchanges. So I'm taking as global the US markets for a moment. This is just this year, right? UK, you're down 20%. How does that feel? Oh, you might think, oh, we're about it's COVID. Of course we are. Really? Because the S&P is up 5% and the NASDAQ's up 30. Let me put it another way for you, my friends. Year to date, this is your this is your poverty gap. This is your poverty gap. 128% on the NASDAQ. The UK market's down 12%. That's a poverty gap because British people invest in their domestic economy and so they don't invest globally and so they've been missing out on returns. Now, you might say, well, it's all very well you saying that now, Alpesh. Why didn't you say it in 1990? Oh, you did. Oh, yeah. Right? I've been banging on about this on my Bloomberg TV show, my Financial Times columns, and in my books. Now, what more do you want me to do, right? Tell the Prime Minister. Funny that, right? This means you're poorer by virtue of your passport and your mindset. It doesn't mean you've got to leave countries. It's just as easy to buy an American company or a global one as it is a British one. And as a British person, if you've got Americans working for you and bringing the dividends and capital gains back to the UK, why would you not? Do that. Here are some names. Year-to-date performance of the S&P 500, the Standard & Poor's 500 American markets, okay? Oh, but I'll be sure it's risky. 
Oh, yeah. Companies like Amazon, risky, really? Uh, by the way, Apple is worth more than the entire FTSE 100. Oh, the are bitch. You didn't tell us to buy that in 1999. Come on, guys. Right? So which of these, though? Look, because it might not be for this year. This is year to date. We want money in JP Morgan, which is down 28%. How do we know it was a Microsoft or an Apple or a Facebook, for God's sake, or a Google? And it's too late for these now. Surely I'll perish. Maybe it's something else. Or well, maybe now's the time British companies are going to turn. I have no loyalty to the companies of a specific country. These are all international anyway. Okay, I have loyalty towards my pension fund and my son's savings. And this is three-month performance worldwide. And every single one of these companies, whether it's from China like Alibaba or Japan, okay, or Taiwan like Taiwan Semiconductor there, every single one of these is listed on a US exchange and you can buy it on your cell phone this afternoon from a UK broker. And I'm not, I'm not affiliate to any particular broker. I don't care which broker you can use. Barclays stock brokers if you want. You can use Halifax stock brokers. You can use Harvey's Lansdowne, AJ Bell. You can use free trade on your app. All right? And we're talking about buying the share. They're just as easy as to buy. You care all about currency risk, Alpesh. Are you kidding me? You make a 100% return and you're worried about a 1% move in the currency? Seriously? Oh, but Alpesh, surely it costs more. Yeah, it'll cost you five pounds more on a thousand pound investment. Really? And that's the reason you don't want to make a thousand pounds because, oh, it might cost me five pounds more. The irrationality of people. All right. And if you don't believe me, it's all in my books. Right. Question. Next question. What should um, what sh <laughs> what should be my investing goal? How quickly does 10,000 become 100,000 if you've got 10K or some of you might have 100K or more? How quickly does 100K become 1 million? Because that's got to be a question we're going to ask ourselves, right? So let's get on with it. Let's now work out a business plan and individual stocks to get us there. Assume you plan to invest over 10 years, right? It's a good long horizon, whether you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, or you're already retired and you're saving that money for your children or for yourself. And you, with my help, okay, let's say you make a modest 20% per annum. Why is that modest? Well, some years, just look at historic stock market performances, Okay, I mean, if you want, look at Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, or if you want, look at the Dow, look at the Nasdaq. Don't take my word for anything. Just look at their performances, right? And let's say with my help, you make 20% per annum. Some years you make more, some years you make nothing, because some years those markets make nothing. But on average, 20% per annum. Okay, nothing extravagant, nothing pessimistic. And let's say you've got 100K to start off with. We'll do the next model with 10K, but let's say you've got 100K. You might have 3 million. Some of you on this webinar have 3 million, 5 million, 10 million. Doesn't matter. Put it into pockets of 100K. In the next slide, we'll put it into pockets of 10K, but 100K in your SIP, ISA, or whatever, right? And you plan to add one and a half thousand each month because you've got income or savings. Let's just make that assumption. Well, over 10 years, at the end of 10 years, you'll have a million. That 100K will have become a million. And I've not mentioned any stocks. I've just said we've got to try and extract that from the market, which if you look historically at the market, not difficult, right? Uh, not easy, but not difficult. We're not doing something impossible, right? Let me put that into graphical depiction. That's what it is, Great. Okay? This blue line is you adding a little bit of capital to it. That's your starting point, 100K, and you end up at a million after year 10. It's as simple as that, okay? Simple as that. That's what we've got to do. So we've got to get the 20%. That's what we've got to try and do. Now, some months, oh, by the way, if you only hit 16% or 15, trust me, the figures still look bloody amazing. The biggest problem people have is... They, A, don't get those returns because they mess it up because they get out of their investments too quickly or hold on too long. It's the first thing. Secondly, they've got rubbish investments. I show you a portfolio of one of my students when he first started out already. Uh, uh, so they don't even get anywhere near this. So we've got to remove that. So let's say instead you've got a modest 10K you start off with, right? And you want to add maybe 6K per year, divided, so 500 pounds a month. And you're starting modestly. And let's say with my help, the 20% per annum, with my help, Okay, well, I'm going to give ourselves 15 years on this, right? 15 years on this. Why? Because you only started up with 10K. So you might be in your 30s, you might be in your 40s. You started off more modest, right? Well, you're going to end up with 600,000 over those 15 years. That's my son. My son's two years old, right? So he's around here in his ISA, right? Because in his ISA, he's not allowed to put too much in. Ah, another great question for Vladislav. Is it possible to invest in American shares with ISAs? Yes, and SIPs. And not just American, Chinese companies listed, you know, Alibaba's listed on, this is not a stock recommendation for Alibaba, by the way, is listed, or Taiwan Semiconductor is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So it's technically an American stock. And you can put that in your SIP and ISA. And it, it, it really annoys me that people don't know this because it is making British people poorer. 
It is making British people poorer and American people richer. And it's got nothing to do with their skills. It's got nothing to do with how hard they work. It's just because by accident of birth, people invest in their domestic markets and are totally ignorant about the basics of investing. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Because the experts like me never tell you. You know why they don't? Because they want to flog you a fund and say, hey, give your money to experts. I don't want you to give it to an expert. Do not give your money to an expert. Nobody gives a damn about your money as much as you do. I want you to get the education and you manage your own money. Be your own stockbroker. Be your own fund manager, right? Don't give it to experts, they're shit, and I'm gonna prove it to you, and I'm from the industry, and I can tell you they are shit con men, all right? And I'm gonna prove it to you on this. I want you to look after it. When you look after it, you'll be able to see exactly what's in your portfolio and whether it's doing good or bad, right? Okay, good, sorry for getting angry, but I know what my colleagues in the industry are like, and they're rubbish. So I keep beating them in competitions, and you'll see that in a second as well. I want you to look after your own money. I want you to look after your own money. There's a shocker, isn't it? I don't want to look after your money, right? Should, and so here's another question. Shouldn't I just invest in a second home for rental arbor? Surely property. What the hell is all this stock market stuff? Why do I want shares? Well, there's a little shocker for you. The US market has risen by more than an average, but more than average house prices since December 2008. Okay, yeah, ooh, ooh, Arpej, yeah, but that's US, maybe their markets work, no, it's pretty similar to ours, all right, in the UK, so you better not think, oh, property always goes up, property always goes up, Arpej, property's leveraged, do not mistake leverage for genius, and I'm going to show you how, if you really want leverage, you can do it with stocks if you want, I'm not recommending it, but you can do it with stocks as you want, listen guys, one more thing I want to tell you, I want to tell you about some technology out of my hedge fund right at the end. You don't have to stay to the end, but I want your permission to talk to you about something that my hedge fund is going to float on the stock market. Can I tell you about our plans to float uh, what we think is the Google of investing on the stock market uh, right at the end, in the last 10 minutes, in the last 10 minutes. And we've still got, trust me, we've got another half an hour to go before that. All right. Okay. So hopefully I've got your permission to do that. Let's talk about leverage then. You said houses. Should we have houses? Should we have houses? Well, let me look at this. Let's say you've got 10,000 pounds or $10,000. Well, that buys you a deposit on a house worth, say, 100,000, for argument's sake, okay? For argument's sake. Now, house goes up 10%, i.e. 10, uh, on, on 100,000, you make $10,000 on your capital deposit. Oh, you make 100%, don't you? If the house goes up 10%, you made 100% on your deposit before tax, interest payments, all the rest of it, right? So $10,000 equally, the same 10,000 buys you, did you know, if you wanted leverage, I'm not recommending you do leverage. We're not going to talk about leverage in this webinar. We're going to talk about buying the stocks and owning the stocks. But if you wanted leverage because you think, oh, property, Arbesh, property, right? Well, $10,000 will buy you $200,000 of Microsoft, Apple, Amazon. I've given those as examples as what I might call safe as houses stocks because each of those companies has over a trillion dollars in their bank accounts. I'm not kidding. They have a trillion dollars in their bank accounts. Can you believe it? They make so much money, they don't know what the hell to do with it. Anyway, I'm giving those just as examples. You might disagree with those picks, but you can look at others. But uh, yeah, I'm giving examples, 200,000. Uh, uh, brokers will give you that leverage if you want. I'm not suggesting you do it, right? As in, I'm just giving you the example, the parallel between property and stocks. Uh, uh, and of course, they've gone up a lot more than houses have. And I think they're safer than bloody houses. I think Microsoft, <laughs> look at the size of that company, is safer than a house in, I don't know, in London or Leeds or Manchester, personally, all right? You might think, no, don't be daft, don't be. No, think about it a moment. Anyway, uh, uh, they've gone up more than house prices have, right? And they and I get more for my money, right? Now, of course, there's a risk. You always make sure you've got capital to back up 50% of the value of the whole investment. Just because you're controlling with $10,000, $200,000 doesn't mean you go and go nuts, okay? What if it fell? You want to have the capital available if something falls. You don't need to deposit it, but you can have it available. This is great if you own a company because it means you don't even have to take the money out of your company and pay yourself a dividend or a director's loan in order to make those investments, uh, uh, which means you save a whole load of tax. Uh, the value of the whole investment, and of course, you want to hold for the long term. Don't borrow money from a broker because brokers, that's what leverage is. They're lending you money, just like a bank lends you money to buy a house. Um, don't borrow to flip. I'm not saying trading. I'm talking about investing. Uh, uh, for what time period? Which stocks? Uh, well, 12 months. I'm going to explain why. And here are some risk-adjusted calculators done by Bloomberg. And here are some of the risk-adjusted. What are risk-adjusted? Well, it means what's the average return and what's the volatility, i.e. the percentage 
uh, 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 by which that average is missed, okay? Those of you who know mathematics and statistics, it's about standard deviations and the mean, right? Risk-adjusted return, so there are some names for you. Let me zoom in. Have you got your phones out? You can take those names if you want. I mean, this is just statistics. I'm not necessarily, by the way, full disclosure, I own Amazon, PayPal, Netflix, Adobe, Eli Lilly, Microsoft, Apple, and Danaher. I happen to own those, all right? But wait a minute, Alpesh. How do we pick these? What are these? Where did you get these from? This is what I'm looking for in any stock. I want these patterns. And I'll tell you in a second which this company is. By the way, here's a little quiz. Which company do you think this is? Over one day, over the last five years, on average, this is what it's done. On any given day, it's given a 0% return. Some days it's gone as much as 15%, but as you can see, it's very rare it does that. Uh, uh, most days, it's just up here. So this is frequency, how often, okay, on the on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, it's the percentage return on any given day. Some days, it's gone down as much as 15% in a day, but it's happened very infrequently, very rarely. Right, over five days, it's this. Over 20 days, it's this, you know, pretty equal. Over a 20-day period, it can either be up or down by an equal measure. You haven't got an edge, really. Uh, over 50 days starts getting interesting. Over 250 days, you're pretty much guaranteed a positive return historically. And not only that, a pretty bloody strong one. Does anybody know which company this is? Somebody said Amazon. Nope, I'm afraid it's not. It's not Amazon. Anybody else? Okay, I'll tell you in a second which company it is. This is what I want. There are a whole bunch of companies where this number is very, very negative. Now you might say, oh, Pesh, are there any companies where all they do every single day is generate 15% up? No, there isn't. That company hasn't been invented yet. Yeah, because if it had, I'd have bought it. Yeah, that's what you're all looking for. Is that one? Oh, but oh, Pesh, aren't there any companies where after five days, there's no negative return? No, that company hasn't been invented either. Oh, Pesh, aren't there any companies which after 20 trading days, i.e. a month, there's no negative return? No. Bloody hell, are you guys kidding me? If that existed, do you not think we'd be piling into it? Doesn't exist. This is a, probably as safe as houses, as good as it gets. That's what we want more of. I'll name you which ones. Traders got it right. Trader and Havinda have got it right. Okay, and I want more of these. I don't put all my money in this, but I want more. By the way, this is also another reason why. You know when people say to you, oh, don't trade for the short term, hold for the long term. This is the reason why. Because if you hold for the short term, like five days, you might be down 16%. If you hold for longer, you've got a high probability of being up, okay, for the whole year. But only in companies which are what's called positively skewed and have a high mean. Positive skew. Write that down. Positive skew, high mean. Positive skew, high mean. Who's going to give you this data? I am. Don't worry. Positive skew, high mean, right? You know what, what private investors invest in? companies with negative skews and low means. You know why? Because they look at a one-day performance and they look at some media from the journalist at Shares Magazine or Investors Chronicle or God forbid, whatever else, and they mess it up. Marek, it's not Apple. Apple's close. Amazon's close to this. Netflix, it's not. Netflix wouldn't be. It's done well recently, but it, it, I'm afraid that figure, the left-hand extreme figure for Netflix is not as nice as that one. It was Microsoft. And I'm going to give you some other names, okay? Similar, right? That's all I want. I want companies like that. You know why? Because then I can sit on my big fat ass and after a year by doing nothing, the most useless profession in the world I'm in, get my returns, okay? And statistically be somewhat short of them. You can see why I leverage on something like that. Ooh, wait a minute, you leverage? But what's your downside risk? I'll tell you. We'll go into that in a second, all right? So here's another question. Yes. But shouldn't I give it to a fund manager, Alpesh, after all? Well, here's a reason not. When the S&P was at 2761, and by the way, today it's at 3,339, this was Wall Street's outlook, right? These guys are the best in the world, and this is what they're advising the, 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 the wealthiest people in the world. When it was at 2761, and don't forget it's at 3,339, Bank of America Merrill Lynch was saying it's going to go to 2,600. Hmm, they're a bit embarrassed. You can imagine that poor Savita, you can imagine their wealthiest clients are a tiny bit pissed off. Okay, CFRA, who the hell are they? Okay, well, they got closer to it. Citigroup, no wonder they've just got rid of their CEO and appointed uh, somebody new because their clients are pissed off, right? They said target 2,700, it's at 3,339. Credit Suisse, clients are pissed off. JP Morgan Chase, clients are okay. Goldman Sachs, clients are pissed off. 
Deutsche Bank, yeah, they're okay. They're happy. Morgan Stanley, clients are pissed off. You know what's worse? These are supposed to be the best and brightest. These are the experts. These are the ones you want to trust. And you've got a whole bunch of us saying it's down here and a whole bunch of us are going to say it's up there. You might as well toss a coin. Yeah? Uh, it'd get worse. Harpish, can't we just give it to a fund manager? Underperform. This is the Financial Times. Okay, this is Chris Flood's article. Underperformance rife among active managers. Do you really want to give it to a fund manager? Don't give it to a fund manager. You're the fund manager. There are some professions you can learn. Driving is one of them. Being a driving instructor is one of them. Being a school teacher teaching English to five-year-olds is one of those professions you can learn. Being a fund manager is one of those professions you can learn. Being a brain surgeon? No. You're not going to learn that, all right? I'm not going to teach you it. You're not going to learn it. There are certain things average, ordinary people like you and me can learn. There are other things which average, ordinary people like you and me are never going to learn, like brain surgery. Investing isn't rocket science, and it isn't brain surgery, all right? As Warren Buffett put it, a higher IQ is actually a hindrance. You know, my biggest problem with managing money, okay, is not to try and be too clever. I outsmart myself. I've got to dumb myself down. I didn't say that. Warren Buffett said it. High IQs are a hindrance to investing because people try and be too clever. Oh, I wonder what's going to be next. Oh, let me see if I can out invent and out think what Amazon are going to come out with next or Apple are going to invent next. No, you're not. It's their job to do it. Don't give your money to a fund manager. Give it to Apple to invest. Okay. Cut out the middleman. Cut out the sodding fund manager. Why? Because you can be better than overpaid fund managers. Want proof? Because I'm a bit gobby, aren't I? And people like me are not supposed to always be quiet and, you know, a bit deferential. So the FT said to me in 2004, hey, if you're so shit hot, why don't we run a competition uh, over a year for you to forecast the markets? And let's see who wins. You or fund managers, people like, you know, amazing people like Neil Woodford, who, by the way, came 14th in that. And that's me at the top. I came top. I said, I'll do that as long as when I win, which I will, you write down in the Financial Times for the world to see Patel is top FTSE 100 forecaster. That was 2004. In 2005, I launched my hedge fund. You better believe I launched my hedge fund with publicity like that. In 2017, this Muppet has destroyed your wealth. I haven't because I'm teaching you how to create your own wealth and not rely on numpties like that. He looked the part. Why did he get all the money? He got the money because he could market better than I could. Simple as that, right? The other ways, you might say, you know, should I give it to fund managers? If you really want to give it to fund managers, X-ray quality. What's quality? Exchange-traded funds. If you really want to give it to a fund manager to manage, use ETFs or exchange-traded funds. Yes, you can put them in SIPs and ISAs. I'll give you an example, qual. That's a qual. That's a fund of stocks. Now, I don't recommend this. I think you should just pick individual stocks because after all, that, this is what it's invested in. Well, wait a minute. I don't necessarily want to put money in 3M, for instance. By the way, of these, which do I own? I own Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, MasterCard, Visa. Uh, that's it. I did own Nike for a short time and then I've exited. Okay. Um, who contributes to qual the exchange traded funds? top returns, these are its top holdings. Well, I'd rather just own them directly but because uh, I do own Microsoft, Apple, MasterCard. I don't have PepsiCo. Uh, there must be reasons for that. Uh, Eli Lilly, I think I've still got, but I might have exited. Uh, okay, so if you really want to, exchange-traded funds is better than actual active fund managers because exchange-traded funds are more passive, right? Um, next question. I don't know how to decide what to buy. So let's get to the nitty-gritty now. I don't know. And that's fair enough, my friends. And that's my fault that people like me ha who don't have a conflict of interest because I'm not a stockbroker and I'm not a fund manager asking for your funds. Hedge funds can't ask for retail money. We go to pension funds. We manage money for pension funds. Aegon, Axe are our clients. Ultra high net worths like the founder of New Look, founder of Cobra Beer, they're our clients, not retail clients. So I have no conflict of interest. So I can tell you the truth because I have no conflict of interest. And by the way, conflict of interest is not me thinking, oh, please get my book, because I'm going to give it to you free, and I get you know, next to nothing in royalties. That's not a conflict of interest, right? Um, I don't know how to decide what to buy. So let's do that. Let me do that for you, because this is what most people are like. Okay, this is what they have. They've got their magazines. They're higher octaned up on their caffeine. They've got Jim Cramer on the news and all the rest of it, all right? Or they've got all this data there, and they don't know where to begin. Because they're thinking to themselves, hey, one day they'll say, oh, director's bought. That's the reason I'll buy. Investors Chronicle journalists wrote a story about it. Seriously, are you going to rely on journalists 
to get to look after your future pension just just think about that a moment what does that guy do he's a journalist and you're gonna say to him hey mr journalist why don't you look after my pension seriously uh valuations one day they go oh, i've got low pe i'll get into it but wait a minute what about price to free cash flow what's the data out there What's the academic research done on it? What about dividend deals? Uh, uh, are they a better factor for performance? And so what happens, and I'll give you an example. This is Lloyd's, okay? People go, oh, I bought Lloyd's. Why? Name recognition. Name recognition is one of the biggest reasons people buy. Despite the fact, I say, oh, you bought Lloyd's, did you? What's your reasoning? Oh, well, it's Lloyd's Bank, isn't it? Safer is a bank. Really? Because in 2015, it was down 4%. Uh, in 2016, it was down 12%, worse than its sector. In 2017, it managed a rare uh, rebound, but below its sector and the FTSE 100. 2018, it was down 23% below its sector and the index. I mean, basically, if you want something which keeps underperforming its sector and its index, hey, pick Lloyd's Bank. And that's what people do. That's just an uh, extreme example. Okay, I use Lloyd's for my banking. It's different. Using something for banking and, and owning the bloody thing is two different things, okay? Uh, are two different things. Uh, and I love the people who work at Lloyd's. Lovely people, sort of the earth. They're my friends. But I don't want to own them, right? Uh, <laughs> so we've got a problem. People don't know what to buy. And when they do think they know what to look at, and there's so much bloody difficult information, they mess it up anyway, let alone the expensive subscriptions. It's my job to pay two and a half grand a month for Bloomberg terminals and Refinitiv terminals and data and subscriptions. It's, that's my job, not your job. You're not supposed to be doing that part of it. All right, so the question then arises, well, how long do I hold for? And I'll give you names of how you do find this information, okay? How long do I hold for? What if the stock falls? What if the stock rises? How do we pick those stocks, okay? Really simple rules I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna get, there's different rules you can have, but I'm gonna give you simple rules. Rule number one, the period, Goldman Sachs, data shows 12 months is the ideal holding period for the simple reason that the impact of financial data upon a company tends to last for 12 months it doesn't last for a day because in a day it's noise it doesn't last for 50 years because new data keeps coming out all right the optimal period tends to be 12 months so that's rule number one rule number two what if it falls Alpesh? well you can have a stop loss 25 to 35 percent it's up to you what how big you make it the market's particularly volatile at the moment so you might make it 35 percent trailing stop loss. So if it goes up and then drops 25 to 35%, you exit, all right? I'm keeping it simple. You can make it more complicated, but I'm just keeping it really simple. Uh, unless it's a quality company, and I only believe uh, there are five quality companies in the world which have got a trillion pounds in the bank. Uh, and in those cases, if they fall, I buy more. And those five companies are these. Now you might say, no, what about Tesla? What about this? What about that? No, don't argue with me. I'm telling you which ones they are, and that's that. You may say, oh, but they're overvalued. Chitesh, you're absolutely right to say. But they're overvalued. They're overvalued. Okay, as people have been telling me in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2007, 2007. Do you want me to keep going? Do you want me to keep going? Actually, they're not overvalued. Uh, they're not undervalued. But have you looked at their uh, the actual factors which make a difference to a share price, such as the croaky? Oh, oh, actually, I haven't looked at that. What, what, what's that again? Oh, but what's value? I thought value is share price, and share price has gone up, so they must be overvalued. Nope, people don't have a clue what valuation means, and they don't know what impact share price movements. Rule number three, what if it rises, Alpesh? Well, rule one applies, which you're going to hold to 12 months, or rule two, which is, well, trailing stop loss, if it rises and falls back 25 35%, get rid of it, or add to the position if you're cost averaging. Okay, what's cost averaging? That's where you say, well, I'm not going to put all the money in this month. I'll put equal amounts each month. Why? Because statistically, that can get you a better entry price. All right, that's a bit more technical. We can come to that later on about rule three. But I'm keeping it really simple. Now, you can amend these rules, but I'm just keeping it simple, right, for you to avoid you outsmarting yourself and messing up. Okay, that's, that's, that's why. I don't know why that slides here. My country, trust me, one of the roles I have for the UK government is to find outstanding technology companies from around the world and bring them to the United Kingdom. That's why, that's my team uh, at number 10, and that's why I was with the Royals. Uh, that slide should have been a bit earlier. Yes, but aren't there inside, oh, that should be, that's spelt wrong. Aren't there insiders like Goldman Sachs and the rest of us who just get screwed? There's insiders and there's the rest of us. You're right. 
Okay, you're right. There are the insiders, people like me, who call the market and get to write about it in the Financial Times, and that's back in 2004. I've been doing this a bloody long time, right? You're right. There are those who get that information data across our desk, people like me who will get data like the UBS view, the year ahead, the conviction list from Goldman Sachs, their best and brightest ideas, people like me who will, Goldman Sachs will send information the chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, lovely lady, Sheila Patel. Thank you very much, she, Mrs. Patel, uh, for sending me uh, uh, documents like this, right? Yes, you're right. We do get that. So are you screwed? No, because there is a limited number of stocks that are out there. And I'm going to show you in a second how you filter, filter, filter. So you'll actually come to the same conclusions, right? You're going to come to the same conclusion of what to help. Very quickly, these four questions, I'm going to do them in one go. What about currency risk of international global holdings? Really, a 1% move in the currency you're worried about when you could be doubling your money? How do I pick brokers I can trust? FCA regulated, or if you're in America, SEC, never Cypriot brokers. Okay, uh, I've already mentioned some. Ha Halifax, Barclay, yeah, names you know, Hargreaves, Santan, AJ Bell, there's a whole bunch of others. Name some brokers if you want, and I'll tell you, right? Do I own the stock or CFD? CFDs, is leveraged, which I gave you an example of earlier. So it's far higher risk because people don't look at the notional value of what they own. They only look at the margin and they think, oh, $10,000 margin, that's all I needed. You can blow that in three days. You want to look at notionally, you're controlling $200,000 of Microsoft. So what if Microsoft drops 50%? Have you got $100,000 you're happy with to be down if it's Microsoft? You might say, yeah, I am. Great, then that $10,000 controls $200,000, you're fine. But on the whole, we're talking about owning the stock, not the CFD in this webinar. How do I save tax? Put it in a SIP or an ISA, okay? SIP or ISA or 401k if you're in the US. But do save tax. Do bloody save tax. Because trust me, when something's gone up 100% and you've got it right, you do not want to be paying 40% of that to the bloody tax man, okay? Now... What's the quickest, easiest way to pick stocks that the gurus, banks, hedge funds have already researched for their wealthy clients? That's the question, isn't it? Now we're getting to a nitty gritty. Answer, and this is, I'm gonna give you a simple answer. There's a million ways to skin a cat, but I'm gonna give you a simple answer for the sake of the webinar. We're gonna filter, filter, filter. Unless something ticks every single box we like, we're not gonna buy it. We're not gonna lose sleep over it. It takes more than five minutes. We're not gonna uh, own it. We're not gonna force ourselves, which is what happens when you're only looking at your domestic market because you've got so little choice, you end up buying crap because you've got so little choice. Whereas you've got a global market of 8,000 equities to pick from, you can be really picky, like interviewing people for a football team or a job. When it's a global audience, you'll go and, and say, no, I only want the best of the best of the best of the best, okay? Now, so we're gonna filter, filter, filter. Which stocks keep coming up in the most strategies? That's what we're going to ask ourselves. So what are those strategies? I'm going to give you some strategies. And only if something meets more, as many of those criteria as possible, do we have it in our portfolio. I only want the best of the best of the best in there. For instance, investing strategy number one. What do the gurus own? I want to make sure I don't want a stock which the biggest hedge funds have not already bought into, okay, where I'm not riding the curves. How do I find that information? Well, it's easy enough. My, you know, but what does Warren Buffett own? This is in the public domain, okay? But that, just because he owns it doesn't mean I'm going to buy it. No, just because he's got 40% of his capital in Apple, I'm going to show you him, um, uh, Carl, uh, oh, sorry, Bill Ackman and uh, Bill Gates in a second. But what I'm saying is just because they own it doesn't mean you buy it. They might have bought it 50 years ago and are sitting on big profits. They don't have tax reasons holding it. No, what I'm saying is we need to know uh, that ticks one box, but there's a few others I need. This is the mistake people make. They go, oh, he's bought it. Some journalist writes an article. They go, oh, so I'll buy it. That's the stupidest, highest risk thing I've seen. What's the aggregate? What's the aggregate of all of them put together? For the S&P 500, it's this. You know what the biggest gurus, the biggest hedge funds, the biggest uh, fund managers own the least of? It's these ones down here. You know what they own the most of? It's these ones in darker green up here. By the way, in case you can't see it, that's United Healthcare. I didn't even know what the hell that was until recently. Out of the S&P 500, that's the most popular company by the biggest, uh, uh, like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's okay. That's something. But uh, I still want to tick more boxes than uh, so some gurus own it. So what? Some hedge funds own it. So what? Okay, what are the other ones? What are the other boxes? Let's come to that. What if you want a bigger return? And I'm going to come to the other strategies. But what if I want a bigger return? How much I want more? Okay, because I'm young. I've got a lot of disposable income. I'm not just saving as a uh, uh, as a pensioner. I want more. Okay, like I said, we will leverage. We will leverage big on lower risk. What does that mean? Well, this is what I own. It's what my son owns. Uh, Apple too. That's leverage. Two times leverage on Apple. I'm not saying you do that. It's higher risk leverage. 
Okay, two times. So that means when Apple goes up a dollar, I make two dollars. If it goes down a dollar, I lose two dollars. But I also know Apple has skew to the right. We call ketosis for those st statisticians out there. It's got a high mean and it's skewed to the right. Okay, uh, uh, I've got some of its ordinary stock. I love Square still. I like Net Company. I own PayPal. I own Zoom. Did I get in late? Well, I was in Silicon Valley. If you follow me on social media, and please, if you don't, this is why you don't have a full copy of my book because you've not followed me on social media. Uh, it's on the website. Okay, just go on the website. I'll give you it all anyway. Uh, you'll see what I own because I post it, right? Um, I was in Silicon Valley last May. I met the CEO of Zoom. That's my job. Smell which way the wind's blowing, right? So that's one. I leverage. What do I do? I buy double leverage Amazons, Microsoft, Apples as well, right? I also have the CFDs in those. So I'm getting 20 times leverage on those in actual fact. But that's higher risk. I don't want to go on to that because that makes sure, well, my personal target is actually more than 40%, but I'm we're talking to a mass retail market, so let's just stick to 20% for now, all right? Leverage is always riskier. Uh, well, look, this is, by the way, United Healthcare. My webinar in April on United Healthcare was um, the target price of the biggest banks was, on average, $323, okay? Its price was 242 at the time, so it was supposed to go from 242 to 323 which is, what, 30%? Yeah, it's a 30% rise. There you go, mental arithmetic. Good. And by today, it has done that. That's not the only one. There's a whole bunch more. What do we look at? We want to make sure, and this is when, when we say, how do you find those companies? We want to tick not just that an analyst has picked it, not just a guru has picked it, but a multitude of gurus and analysts have recently picked it with high enough price targets to make it interesting. And recently, not four months ago, and at big enough banks, I don't give a damn what a journalist at the Investors Chronicle thinks about a particular bloody company. I do care that Goldman Sachs does because they can make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I don't care what Goldman Sachs thinks unless Deutsche Bank and Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo and Nomura and Barclays, okay, and Merrill Lynch and RBC Carroll all think the bloody same way. Why? I'll push you so belt and braces. I'm not belt and braces. I'm 15 belts and 15 braces because it's my pension, not yours. I care about my money more than you do. Okay. So what else boxes need to be ticked? This is the most important box for me that needs to be ticked. It's this one. And I'll explain to you what. This is what the biggest banks and hedge funds tell their wealthiest clients. They look at this, the Z score, the Altman score. What's the Altman score, Arbus? That looks bloody complicated. Don't worry. It's not. It's not because you don't need to worry about the formula. You don't need to worry how a car or a television works in order to use them and enjoy them, do you? No. What's the Altman score? Well, it looks at working capital. Look out of the window during COVID. What's really important at the moment? Um, I think working capital is Alpesh. I think retained earnings or profits they've kept is. So this is what it does. This was created in 1967, I think. 1960 bloody seven. Okay, higher the number, the better. I at least want that number greater than one and a half. Okay, ideally, I want it above three, right? Okay, croaky. This is even more important to me than the Altman score. This is a slide from Goldman Sachs Asset Management, okay? Hedge fund managers like me get the privilege of seeing this kind of stuff. This is what they use to tell their wealthiest clients. It was invented by Deutsche Bank. It's used by Goldman Sachs to tell their wealthiest clients which stocks to go into. This is one of their slides. What does it measure? It measures, I'll tell you the number. I want this croaky cash return on capital invested to be greater than 10%. When people say to me, oh, but Alpen, what about PE ratio? You find me an article where Warren Buffett talks about PE ratios or Carl, uh, 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 sorry, Bill Ackman talks about them or Joe, Jim Simons does. You don't even know who those people are, do you? Yeah, PE ratios is what journalists use. It's what retail clients use, right? It's not what hedge fund managers and Goldman Sachs use, right? No more than we use horse and carriages. They were great 100 years ago, but was moved on. We got a bit more sophisticated alongside the invention of the computer and the algorithm. Thanks very much. All right. This is cash flow, right? Cash flow over capital invested. If that number's above 10%, company is likely to generate returns. 
It's likely to generate returns. It's as simple as that. And if you want to know, there it is. There's the slide. I've taken it from Goldman Sachs, Global Investment Research, Quantum Database from Goldman Sachs. Okay, there's the number. And you want to know how good this croquis is? There it is. The top quartile of companies on the stock market, the top 25% of croquis, cash return on capital, will give you a 30% per annum return. The bottom, the ones with the worst croquis, will give you 11%. There's no mention of P ratios and oh, stock prices have gone up. Surely they're overvalued. Seriously? So I want that box to be ticked. I want that box to be ticked as well as the gurus owning them. What do the gurus own? You might want to take a picture of this. That's Bill Ackman, legend. Bill Gates, you might have heard of him. Carl I Icahn, you'll have heard of him. George Soros, Jim Simons, Leon Cooperman, and Warren Buffett. What do they own? What are their top 10 holdings? These are their top 10 holdings. I want that box to be ticked just because they hold, own it. doesn't mean I will. Get your phones out. Have you got your phones out? Can you see that? Let me zoom in. Right? There they are. There you go. It doesn't mean I buy it just because they have. That's just another box that needs to be ticked. Why am I filter, filter, filtering? That's the best advice I can give all of you. Filter, filter, filter. Make sure as many boxes are ticked as possible. Hedge fund ownership reports. I want that box ticked. Right, get your phones out. Are you taking this photo? There it is. That's the biggest investment. But, oh, but Alpesh, somebody hasn't told the biggest, richest companies and hedge fund managers that Amazon's overvalued. Yeah, they didn't get that memo. But you did, so it's okay. Or Microsoft is, or Facebook is, or Visa, MasterCard, Alphabet. I own Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Visa, MasterCard, Alphabet, PayPal. I'm going from top to bottom. I don't have Salesforce, but I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I own Netflix, uh, Charter Communications, Adobe, Apple, Square, Moody's. No, I don't have Moody's. I don't have Moody's. I don't have Moody's. That's it. Okay, so declaring my interest. But hey, you know, what do they know? You said they're overvalued, Alpash. I also own Globan. I want to know. I want to tick as many boxes. I want to know what the hedge funds are getting into. I want to know how much money they're putting in. Okay. And I'm going to give you more names. I own Cadence, right? Okay. But how many stocks should I own, Alpash? That's a lot of names you give me. That's the next question people have. Well, this is it. 15, right? If you're more risk averse, you can have as many as 40 if you want. But as you can see, the diversification benefits uh, of risk reduction does not increase significantly after the 15 mark. Okay. Doesn't happen. You, you it just doesn't. All right. We can argue the toss. I'll go into statistics if you want, but that's the number. That's the number. And if you want to know something interesting, see these billionaires, see these billionaires, that's their top 10 holdings. If you look at, if you add up the percentages, that's their top 10 holdings. By the time you've got to 0.08%, that's it. They've got 10 bloody holdings. Okay. Who's that numpty at the top? Bill Ackman. Look him up. Google him. He's got 10 holdings. Warren Buffett, with all his money, he's only got 50. He's only got, now you might surprise Jim Simon's got 3,402 because Jim Simon's is a, a, a hyperactive fund manager. Um, they use algos. The, the, Bill Gates has only got 23 holdings. And he's top 10. The one with number 10 least holdings is only 1.73%. My point is, you can see they only have about 15 bloody stocks, okay, uh, making any impact. Right, so don't have 40, 50 stocks. What do I do? We put it all uh, into all of this. They're the croquis. I'll give you some more names in a second. Sortinos, I haven't got time to go through Sortinos and Alpha, two of the most important things. When the world's richest sovereign wealth funds look to allocate money, they will ask the fund managers they're gonna put the money into, what's your Sortino and what's your Alpha? Not sharp, <laughs> not sharp unless um, you're living in the 1960s, Sortino and Alpha are the things they're going to ask, and Deutsche Bank and Goldman Sachs are going to look at croquis on the individual companies they invest in, not PE ratios, okay, unless you're living in the 1960s, right? So I've given you a load of names, what I own, what some of the biggest names in the industry own, and why. Filter, filter, filter. If I'm going to put it in simple terms, it's this, okay? Monitor infrequently. Because the more you, I showed you the, I showed you the distribution curves. If you monitor every single day, all that's going to happen is you're going to panic yourself. And you're going to get out because something is down 10%. Well, in actual fact, over the space of a longer period of time, if the positively skewed as the stocks that we've looked at are, then you're fine. Okay. Right. Diversify. Make that, all that means is they're not correlated. I'm heavily invested in tech, but my tech's diversified. Are you telling me Amazon is exactly the same as Microsoft, as, as Apple? Well, Amazon doesn't make headphones or phones for that matter. Okay, stop loss, 
in performance stocks, like I said, 25% to 30%. If it falls, you get out unless it's a quality company. I gave you the names of the five there. Uh, if they're quality companies, what if it rises? Well, if it's a quality company, I may well even add to it, right? Hold for 12 months. Uh, don't do this between nine and five. Do it over the weekend, like tomorrow, okay? Because you won't then be looking at the price going, oh, it's moving, it's moving, I better buy it. In one hour, you should be able to get an investment list, a short list of 10 to 15 stocks. Do that once a year. Yeah, don't do it every five minutes, every year. That's my holy grail. That's my secret vault. I look, I tick, tick, tick. How many of these are green? I want more greens as possible. The more greens I get, that's the stock I want then. It's as simple as that. The more greens. The biggest problem we then faced, and this is the next question we were asked, can't you hold my hand and do it for me? And I said, no. The whole point of this is you learn to do it. Not we do it for you. You do it. Your money in your bank account because you're going to save the fees you're otherwise going to pay away. And the people who were asking was this were pensioners. There were 30 to 40 something. Um, there were people who were annoyed with their underperforming fund managers who were only investing in domestic stocks, uh, had too many stocks or too few, didn't have a plan to get from here to their return goals, okay, and didn't know how to make a portfolio. All right, so people said, can we be your student, can we be your apprentice? And I took on some interns. They were young, they were just students. Uh, uh, so I took them on. I developed all of this when I was at university. That's me, Red Carnation, last exam. I perfected the strategy. I won awards in the FT. I then wrote books because I wanted the profile so I could raise more capital for my fund from institutions. We only have institutional investors. Uh, that's the law. Uh, okay, and won those competitions, even though I saw people like Woodford who were rubbish, but still getting more capital than me, even though, yeah, I'm pissed off and bitter, okay? And people kept asking me, can you do it? And I thought, no. And then we thought, you know what? Why don't we float a company? Why don't we float on the stock market a company? Why don't we make a multi-million pound out of our hedge fund? What we do, why don't we let private investors do it? The mass market, a global audience company like a Google, okay, which will be a billion dollar business where people can learn from me, self-paced. They can have one-to-one -one with me, one-to-one, -one, thanks to Zoom and Skype, okay, at their own time, uh, with no travel or uh, hotel costs, no COVID, no, con no connections to a broker, okay? Uh, uh, they get the Goldman Sachs info, they got ongoing support for life, no monthly fees, daily fees, weekly fees, none of that, but they get daily updates, alerts, newsletter, uh, uh, software, but without a subscription fee, they get all of that and an education as well for life updated every single week. Okay, given that I've got all of these credentials, I'm a visiting fellow at Oxford University, so that's the academic research part, and the FT is the uh, award-winning picks. Okay, given that I've got that and nobody else has got that, we thought we've got to spin this company out. We have got to spin this company out. Um, and then I've talked about it on the press, as you might have seen. Uh, you'll have seen me on various newspaper reports and stuff talking about my market views uh, and market turmoil and you know, then all the rest of it, and they're lovely, lovely people on CNBC, Bloomberg, BBC, I do so much of, uh, I thought, you know what? We've already got so much in place. We have already got the credentials and everything else, but there's people who wanted it. People who are on this webinar wanted it. We thought, you know, between Skype, so now you've got technologies out of that individual connection, Telegram, which is like, uh, sorry, WhatsApp, which is like uh, Telegram, okay? And given that we had hedge fund managers saying great things about me, thought, you know what, we've got everything in place for a billion dollar company to train people and give them that education, but not charge them anything and let them have access for life. Give them the course material, but access to me uh, uh, and us go through their portfolios. So we put it together and we put this together. Why not let a hedge fund manager help you pick stocks? Basically, pro-level training course, updated weekly, one-to-one -one calls, approved list of stocks, the whole 8,000 spreadsheet, guidance, mentoring, daily updates from me uh, uh, for life. For life, given that I'm on all these places, why not do that? Why not turn ordinary people into extraordinary investors? Let them turn 10,000 into 100,000, 100,000 into a million, okay? Give them access to my portfolio, access to conferences, webinars, real-time investment alerts from me, uh, at what I'm buying, what I'm selling, analysis of each stock. Give them access to what Warren Buffett's portfolio has, Bill Gates's has. Give them all of that information. Go through their portfolio with them one-to-one. -one. 8,000 global stocks filtered, right? All of that uh, 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 and do it uh, uh, and give them all of this as well. Basically every single, all the mosaic of information I get access to. Then we had amazing responses, you know, from people who we trialed this with. We opened it up and we got amazing responses. I'll show you that what those are going to in a second. Okay, and then we thought, right, we're going to do this. 
Um, in the first seven days, we're going to evaluate your portfolio. I'm going to do it personally. I'm going to have a call with you. I'm going to have two calls with you. Actually, you're going to suggest what the financial goals should be, what's wrong with your existing one, where it should be based on our education. So you get your holdings right. It's your portfolio and your broker, okay? Track you, have calls until it's all set up and correct, but make sure the education is the basis on which you make the decisions. For life, no monthly fees, no weekly fees, nothing else. Okay, most successful person I've ever trained up using this, and this is when we knew we had a billion dollar business, Naomi Wastel, investment manager at Newton. She manages 10 billion. She left university, joined me, worked as my assistant for three years. I trained her up. She then left and joined Newton, and today she manages 10 billion. I'm going to take some credit for that. I'm going to take some credit for that. You better believe I am. Okay, we do Zoom calls, Skype with me, Telegram and WhatsApp, okay? So you see all of that and an online course as well. Created by me, all videos, all materials by me, updated weekly as well. I want people to go on to this. I want people to sign up to this uh, uh, because we want to get to a 1,000 people in batches of 10 at a time, 1,000 people going through it, and then we're gonna get venture capital investment at a 30 million valuation, and then we're gonna put it on the stock market a couple of years later, and we think eventually it's gonna be the Google of investing or the Microsoft of investing. It's gonna be a billion dollar company because it's gonna have the course material, it's gonna have all the bits of software that we use. You don't have any ongoing costs. We take you to the software that we use, all the bits, and we also handhold you, okay? For that reason, because then that's what it's called. We called it the Great Investments Program because we're after great investments. Uh, yours for life, no ongoing charges, one-to-one, -one, daily updated course for life. And in the first seven days, in the first seven days, call with me to go through your portfolio, take you through the key education, get you to plan of action, and then have the second call and ongoing onwards. So we thought, what should we price this at? Now, don't be scared. It is not 90,000. We thought, oh, yeah, lifetime updates are going to be worth quite a bit. Uh, you yeah, know, there's softwares, mentoring, there's course, there's tips, there's alerts. Added value over 10 years to your portfolio, at least 50, I would have thought. Access to Goldman Sachs reports, five premium data, five daily updates for live free software source for you, monthly tips, newsletter by me, weekly updates. Surely all of these things come to 90. We thought, well, that's not mass market. We want to take this to the mass market. And because it's mentoring by me, I limit it to 10 at a time. Eventually, it'll be other people mentoring. But for now, the people who sign up in the first thousand, it'll always be me. That's the URL. That's what we've created out of the fund. We think it's the best way to make social change to, for people. We think it is the best way to get people to take greater accountability from everything that I've taught them. Some of you might just say, no, you taught me everything. I don't need it anymore. Others will say, no, 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 we want to do this. We want to do this. Uh, okay, 50% off only on the webinars, okay, only on the webinars, all right? And what that gets you is access to me and the program, okay? And when you go there, by the way, if you want, you can have it in installments, okay? And there's 50% off, so you can see the price goes right down to there. There's VAT if you're in the UK or EU, Okay, and there's PayPal and there's credit card and Google Pay as well and all the rest of it. Uh, we've had great, I mean, look, Nathan Moss, uh, Maryland HSBC, the internet trading course, uh, uh, this is about my other work, generally about me and my investing, is the best guide of its kind to personal investing, will satisfy the beginner and the professional, COO, Merrill Lynch, HSBC. Uh, Chairman Chicago Board of Trade gets the hard matter of trading, like clearly elucidating methodology, successful trading strategies. The point is, I want a whole army of people who are actually able to take control of their own investing, and create wealth for themselves. By the way, seven day no risk money back guarantee. In those seven days, we go through, I go through and have those calls with you twice, your portfolio, where it is, where it should go to the education based upon it and access to all the materials. You'll have access to all the materials, including all the course material. So seven days risk free uh, money back guarantee. Okay, in those seven days, if you're don't, not happy, you get your money back. Uh, let me know as you sign up, because as you do, I am going to, uh, uh, as you sign up, I'm going to give you a shout out, okay? Uh, this is the stuff you'll learn, right? And you don't have to learn the material, because you could just, some people say, I don't want the course material, I just want you to handhold me. Let's go through your approved list of stocks, out of the 8,000, what you like. Let's look at what we've got. Let's remove the rubbish of what we've got. 
What should we be telling our uh, in financial advisor? Who should we be using? How do we get to the financial goals you've mentioned? Uh, how do we learn how to do that? And then they like to know, oh, Arpish, you mentioned this and this is what you're looking at. Oh, they like to know, oh, I see. So if I do want to learn more about it, it's there. And it's me who's created all of this. It's me. And the reason is because we have to do that within our own hedge fund. When Naomi was being taught stuff, this is the stuff she went through anyway. Okay, so we just put it in. We thought, wait a minute, if we're creating fund manager managing 10 billion, why are we not making this into a billion dollar company which we can float? And that's the idea behind it because there's lots of softwares in there you can use and tools and everything else. Okay, and my job is to give all that data and information. Some people don't want the data and information, some people want. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, as well. Okay, um, no worries, Marek, no worries at all. Uh, my pleasure. And so you've got this. Okay. And by the way, we've got people who are, most people are pre-retirement. Some have retired and then looking at it. We've got 30-somethings, 40-somethings. I'd say the mean age is about in their 50s, but the 30-somethings have got to jump on everyone else because they've got more time in order to grow the wealth. Uh, we've got a couple of 70-year-olds who want to leave it for their grandkids and so on. And it's to get everything in order uh, and make sure they've got that hand-holding and that mentoring. We've got couples Husbands and wives, it's very popular. We've got uh, a couple of fathers and daughters, fathers and sons. Um, we haven't got any mothers and daughters or mothers and sons yet, but anyway. Uh, uh, so we do have that as well. I got a lovely message from somebody yesterday. And despite his surname being Patel, he's not related to me. And he said, thank you, you paid for my daughter's wedding. And I kid you not, that came in. I'm going to promote that on social media because you would, wouldn't you? Um, and I tell you what, brought a tear to my eye. Couldn't believe it. Um, we had another one, Ravi Shah, and that is on the website. Ravi's is on the website because with Ravi, uh, he took heed of what I said and he made the donation to charity. Where's Ravi? Uh, he's down here. He's actually done a video for us as well because of the returns he made. Anyway, he's on the website, arpishpatel.com forward slash shares. There he is. There's Ravi. Um, and he's made a donation to the charity as well. Okay. As you come on, let me know. Jazz, which SIP funds invest in quality? Like, um, which SIP funds? A SIP is an account, okay? Um, a fund is what you put into a SIP, right? And exchange-traded funds, uh, which invest, we go, we break that down as well, but I gave you the URL earlier, uh, not the URL, the um, of the exchange-traded funds, QAL, Q-U-A-L, all right? Um, but there are others. And what we look for, if you're looking at exchange-traded funds, because you think, oh, I just want a basket of stocks, but I think you should have the individual ones because you'll get a better return. Um, but if you're looking at just a basket of exchange-traded funds, um, then the two things to look for is the Sortino and the Alpha. If you don't do that, you're going to get screwed on exchange-traded funds. 90% of exchange-traded funds will not generate you a positive return if you haven't looked at the Sortino and the Alpha. Okay, it's as simple as that. I'm telling you right? Do not go by what they say on the name. Oh, we are UK growth or whatever, or uh, innovation, because they're trying to sell you stuff. Look at their Sortino, look at their alpha. They're the two most important things for exchange trade funds that you should look at. Okay, uh, that's enough of that one. I've shown you what we're doing there. Our goal, by the way, if you've got any problems signing through, a few of you have come through already. If you've got any problems signing through, there's also this. You can just do it direct. If you're in the UK or EU, it's VAT, uh, or you can play annually if you wish. Um, uh, if you're not, then it's without VAT. It's as simple as that. There is seven-day notice guarantee, Sharon. Thank you very much. Um, there should still be a couple of licenses left. I take people in batches of 10. I do not know if I'm going to have any available next week. It all depends on my time uh, uh, and all the rest of it. The reason I take them in batches of 10 is because I'm doing the handholding. For the first 1,000 in batches of 10, it'll be me. And thereafter, and I do have support from my team, but it's always me who will be your point person. Uh, after that, it'll be uh, other people we might have in the future. But you guys will always have me. Uh, if you go, you've got two URLs to remember. Uh, the reason there's two URLs is really simple, because the website bloody crashes. Um, when these websites get more than like five people on them at the same time, they think it's a Russian attack or something. Okay, so it's there where it says add coupon, put the coupon in, okay, uh, which is org18, and then it will discount and give you 50% off. Or go to shares to the coupons already embedded. If you want, you can have installments. And then it's that. It's as simple as that. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're nearly done on that. I think I've answered every single question that there is. I think we're running out of 
licenses, uh, credentials on all of this, even more. Peter Curtis, chairman of CMC, who, by the way, I think their share price has quadrupled in the last, this year, by the way. Uh, Opportunity insight to the markets and trading is the most must read for traders of all levels. Big, you know, there's something for everyone. This is from Shares Magazine. That's from IG. That's from the CEO of TD Waterhouse. That's from CEO of City Index. That's from CNBC Arab as chairman. The lid off the trading black box, okay, has been well and truly lifted. I have great many testimonials. They're on the website as well. You saw that I won the competitions. I wanted to share that with the broadest possible audience. So as well as these free webinars, that's what I do, okay, as well. Uh, for all of you who don't have the URL for getting the free book, the free book, whoops, okay, bum, 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 go to, uh, da, 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 da. I'm just going to give you the URL for that. And you will see it. The book's called Investing Champions. Uh, sorry, the book's called Investing Unplugged, and there'll be a link on here. Go there, uh, investing-champions.com, and it'll be on there, okay, um, uh, under one of the lectures, right? So that's it. It's as simple as that. That's our ambitions. That's our goals. We want this to be a billion dollar company. We think it can be with the technology, the, 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 the support systems that we have and what we're providing. We think there is nobody who competes with this uh, and gives this level of quality of service and know-how and wealth creation for the masses. That's our goal. That's our aim through education, education, education. That is the silver bullet. It is education. Um, so there it is. Thank you all very much. I've overshot by 15 minutes forgive me i want to thank everybody who signed up i also want to thank uh, uh all of you for being on here as well thank you very much ash david stephen robert martin uh carl victor uh another dave uh thank you all very much and everybody else as well any other questions let me know otherwise i'm going um philip it's on there there's a message which was sent um, you should be able to see the message. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'll put the message up here. Do, 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 do. I tell you what, I will make it available on the, this will make it even easier for you. Give me 10 minutes and I will make sure it is on this link only for the next uh, 24 hours. Okay, it is on alpestrell.com forward slash shares. I'm going to put the book on there right you won't need to have owned paid anything it's going to be free 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 the book the book it'll be on there okay i'll put it on there but give me five minutes after this webinar to do that and it'll only be on there for 24 hours okay and then it won't be uh the book the book i'm talking about the book now okay investing unplugged all right uh thank you all very much i hope you found all of that eye-opening and uh direct and to the point thank you everybody who's a student Welcome students, I'm gonna be speaking to you and messaging you straight after this. Let's get on that road. Let's get analyzing the portfolios. Let's get making uh, a financial plan for you and creating longer term wealth for you and using that uh, for your future and your pension and your financial success. Thank you all very much. I am going to turn off the screen share. There we go. Thank you all once again for being on. Well, you can see the books and awards and all the rest of it from over my shoulder. Um, and yeah, that is Margaret Thatcher. Yes, I am a child of the 80s. Apologies if that's divisive. Uh, so anyway, okay, everyone, I'm going to go. Um, like I said, thank you all very much for being on uh, here. Thank you.